All right. So thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, this is the second in our series of um, demonstrations uh, for the Super Facility Project. Um, we have a, a total of five demonstrations planned um, this uh, month um, on topics varying from uh, uh, data movement and management tools like we'll be talking about today, um, networking um, tools as we talked about uh, last week, and in future uh, demonstrations, we'll be looking at um, edge services in SPIN. Uh, we'll be looking at Jupyter, um, Jupyter Notebooks and Capabilities at NERSC. And we'll also be looking at the NERSC uh, Super Facility API. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the Super Facility project, this is a project that was started um, a little over a year ago now to coordinate some of the work that's being done in the computing sciences area uh, in Berkeley Lab. Um, including uh, work that's being done at ESNet, um, at NERSC, and in the Computational Research Division. This is all work that's um, being uh, designed to support experimental science, um, experimental science teams that need access to high performance computing and networking. So uh, we planned this um, demo series as a way of uh, kind of showing off some of the tools and capabilities we've been developing in this project um, to uh, a wider audience. Um, so these uh, demos are being recorded. I'll share the link to our web page in the chat window shortly. It's also in the calendar invite um, where the recordings are posted. Um, and so you can check out uh, last week's demo and you can also um, uh, see today's uh, when uh, if you want to recap anything. So um, I'll now hand over to our speakers, our demonstrators for today. Um, we have Lisa Gerhardt, Annette Grenier and uh, Björn Enders from NERSC who will be presenting uh, demonstrations of some new tools um, that will uh, make it easier to move and manage data at NERSC. Hi Debbie, Hi. thanks Debbie, thanks for the introduction. Um, hopefully everyone can see the slides now. Um, <laughs> Yes, we can see this. Thing. Okay, sing out if you can. Um, so yeah, like Debbie said today, um, uh, we're going to be talking to you about some of the data management tools and capabilities we've developed at NERSC uh, to facilitate complex workflows. Um, okay. um, so uh, the main point of, the, of interfacing with the super facility project is to be able to work um, directly with science groups to to address common pain points related to data management, data movement, those kinds of things. Uh, and the idea here is that we want to build um, common building blocks um, that our, our science partners can grab onto um, and then use those to build their own dedicated portals. So we don't want to do anything that's, that's tailored to a specific group. We want to look at what the general problems are that are experienced by all uh, by most science groups at NERSC and, and try and come up with some solutions to make things, uh, to make those easier. You know, and some common issues that, that come up repeatedly um, are things like uh, moving data between the layers at NERSC. You know, we have uh, three layers, maybe four if you count, four if you count the burst buffer um, that you need to move your data between uh, and curating this data. Moving it between the layers um, is, is uh, sometimes often the full-time job. Uh, particularly difficult is um, getting your data into HPSS um, and dealing with that, that layer because it's a it's a different interface um, and, it, and it's a different kind of, it's a tape archive, so it takes a different kind of thinking um, to deal with it. And so that, that requires a lot of time. So this is, this is a common issue across the groups is dealing with how you're moving your data between your layers and getting, getting it into that tape archive. Um, another issue that comes up fairly frequently is sharing data. Um, and this is both internally sharing data, like within your group, um, you have someone, you have a bunch of data, you wanna make sure that it's available for everyone to run analysis on. Um, and then externally, when you have something you want to publish, or you have a set of refined data set, how do you share that or move it into and out of the center easily and smoothly? Um, so we've developed several tools um, that are designed to address these issues. Um, and we're going to run through a bunch of demos on how to interact with them and use them. And one thing I will say is that please feel free to, to, to ask questions during the demos. Um, just go ahead and, and um, type it in the chat or unmute and ask, um, and we'll, we'll um, we'll be happy to, to walk you through them. Um, and so um, up first we have Annette. Um, she's going to talk about the PI dashboard. So let me just stop sharing so that she can share. All right, let me get the correct 
share going here. All right, are people able to see that all right? Yes, we can see it, thanks. Cool. Um, oh, I see, it's just not doing presentation mode. That's okay. All right, so um, the PI dashboard is uh, an important piece of what we're putting together here. Um, it's basically meant for people at NERSC to be able to share or and work with the data that they have, manage the data um, for their group and be able to share it amongst each other. Um, one of the really common issues that we find happening uh, for PIs in particular is, uh, and actually for everybody in the group, um, when somebody puts a, a file in a shared space but doesn't have the permissions set correctly or doesn't have the ownership set correctly, then other people aren't able to see it and do what they need to. Um, so often this burden falls on the PIs to try to fix it and they end up coming to, um, maybe they'll have to uh, uh, post a ticket and talk with a consultant and figure out how to fix that. And so we're building a system where they can go into a nice web GUI and make the changes themselves instead of having to go through a third party and have their their uh, have the response uh, in a reasonable response time. So uh, the kinds of permissions that we're talking about here um, are where people should be able to change the group of a file or directory. Um, we also want them to be able to change the actual uh, permissions set on a read, write, execute for the group level. And then uh, we're not yet uh, showing this particular thing, but we do plan to have it also possible to change the actual owner of the file. Um, we're waiting to get uh, the security check and everything and make sure that things are working smoothly on the change group and change the, change the mode of the file before we change ownerships. Um, and we're also putting together um, some common presets where you can actually just basically with one click have a, a specific change made that we know is really commonly needed. And so you'll see an example of that in the demo. Um, and while this is, is working for you in the background, it actually it tracks where your request has gone. It lets you know if there's an error, it lets you know when it completes. Um, and as a, so this is uh, still under internal review at the moment, um, but it is functional. And so I can actually give you a live demo. So are you able to see the Minersk webpage? I'm still seeing your slides. Ah, okay. Um, I think this is probably... Is that what others are saying? Yeah, I still see the slide. Yeah, I think it's just that it's doing it. Does that change it? No, it's just no. I see your desktop. Oh, interesting. Okay. Did you? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, there you go. And now it's there. All right. I'm going to be looking upward for a bit here, but that's okay. <laughs> um, all right, so my NERSC is already a thing that we have here. Um, we have a component of that called the data dashboard that we've shown to people before. So I'm not going to really go into that, but this is kind of parallel to that. It will be another item in the my NERSC menu. Um, and right now we're calling it the, the PI dashboard. Um, that name may change, but we'll see. Uh, so log in to my NERSC. Why do I have such a long password? I don't know. And get my MFA going. Okay, so this is the interface for the PIs to be able to, to make these kinds of changes on their files. Um, let's see. Okay, so the first thing you're gonna wanna do is select a uh, project root directory. So when, when you are logged in, the system knows who you are. So it actually pulls a list of, of the projects that you are a PI or PI proxy on. So the list you see here, uh, these are all set up, these are directories in a thing called CFS dev, which exists only for testing for this. Normally in production, this would be in CFS or project A or, well, not A anymore, um, but whatever, project area you guys have that would that would show up um, and I'm gonna just choose dash directory 
um, because this is one that we have set up some files in that we can fiddle with and not have problems. Um, so this button here, um, make the entire project directory group readable. This is one of the buttons that's you know, set up to do a really common task. And so what this will do, um, if I click on it, it's gonna change the group of all the files and directories within that pro project directory recursively. So it's gonna get everything um, to the group ownership, to the group that is the group that owns the project directory itself. So this it basically um, has figured out which directory I'm talking about and knows who owns that directory. And it's just gonna take that, that group ownership and, and apply it to all the files in that directory. And then it will also make all those files group readable so that everybody in the group has access. So I can click okay. Um, and the request is pending. Um, we're saying it should complete in the next few hours. Um, right now, I mean, these things are going really fast because the, there's a little script that's running every, what is it, Lisa, maybe every five minutes or something. It's, it's pretty darn quick. Um, five, yeah. And it could take longer, though, if somebody else has started a process that happens to be a long recursion that will take a long time. So just in case we're giving people more time. Um, so once I put that in there, you see under pending requests that that should be showing up as an item. Oh, wow, it maybe actually got done already. <laughs> Is it recently completed? Yep. Can I ask 14. a short question? Sure. Uh, what happened if two proxies give, uh, will make a request of change on the same subset of data? They will be done sequentially or concurrently? They, they, they of course, may be contradicting each other. They'll be done in the order in which they came in. Okay. Yeah. So you can see this actually got completed already. <laughs> um, and there, there's two calls here. There's one to the, the changing the permissions and one to changing the group readability um, or changing, changing the group. Um, and these items that are showing up in the recently completed stuff, you can get a little detail about it. Usually it's just the request completed. Uh, if there was an error, Here's one. You'll get the details of the error and figure out why that happened. This example is just from a bug I was fixing. Annette, who is, what's, what's running this in the back? Where is this running? Yeah, so this is a script um, that Lisa put together that is basically just picking up data from a database. So this particular front end is just sending the request into a database and then the script reads from the database the list of the commands that are requested. Is it, I mean, it's going through an API, I would assume, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And then the script itself is running on some privileged node or something? Yeah, yeah. Lisa, did you want to throw in anything about that? No, everything you said is right. There's a, we have a, a privileged node that uh, lives in the storage space that picks up these commands and then it, it does do some extra um, checks on the back end um, to make sure that they're reasonable commands and allowed commands. Okay. Is this interface already available to us or? Not yet, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. I was just We're trying to follow along and they couldn't find it. So that's yeah. why. Thank yeah. You. Yeah. Okay. So once you've got your project directory selected, of course, there's other things you might want to do there. Um, and so the rest of this is kind of sort of more file by file uh, changes that you might want to make. Um, so you can move in the path that you're all into. Um, actually, I'll show you as you change which directory, of course, we don't have any files in that one, but this path updates to, to match it. So use the one with actual files in it and we can do some browsing. Um, so you can just type the path if you like typing paths better, um, go through it that way. Or you can click around, um, go up and down, just like a typical, you know, graphical file directory traverser. Um, and so you might want to pick some files to operate on, you might want to select a lot of them. Although, since you can do stuff recursively, you shouldn't really mostly need to select a lot. But I'm going to just operate on the JavaScript files here. And now that those are selected, I can do things like change the group of the selected files. Um, so this will figure out which groups I have permissions on. And I just 
and I'm limited to those ones. Say, well, let's keep it in DAS. And I can make it recursive if I want. Submit a request and they get the same kind of response. Okay, it's pending. And you can see down below it has already shown up in the pending. Um, if I want to change permissions on it, I have a little more granularity here. You, you, have, you have typical read and write. You also have some options in executing where you can set that you, know, you just want it to run normally, or you, if it's a binary file, you might want to have it uh, run as the group, so set group ID. And then, of course, you also have the nice option of applying that to a directory so that you can make sure that the, when people create files in that directory, their ownership is correct. Or you can just you know, set off a recursive command where you might want to just say, well, apply the execute bit to everything, but I don't want the files to be executable, just the directories. Uh, and then again, you can make them recursive if you like. So submit request, should look familiar. And as you see, this showed up as pending again. And pretty quickly, these will start to show up completed as well. Uh, so that's that's basically it. Um, actually, we can probably start to see some of the changes happening as well. Well, I went to DAS anyway, so <laughs> I'm not changing anything. But so that, that's basically what this interface is doing right now. So can I ask one more question? Yeah. So if if PI requests a change for some directory, and at the same time, a user will add the files or delete the files from the directory, how this will work? Uh, um, I think it would just come back with an error if the file was actually deleted before the the command ran, and then and you this would terminate the it. command, or it will be done for all other files. It will still complete. Oh, I see. Um, I guess it would depend on whatever the response of that command would normally be at the command line when, if the directory or file got removed while it was running something recursive. I'm not sure what it so does. So the question is very it, specific. Like, so what it would do is it would it would run the um, the command and then if if an if the command would normally raise an error like that's missing, um, that error gets reflected back um, to the the web page. But comment continues or comment aborts on the first error. It should continue. Okay. Um, unless I, I would I imagine it's just Chimod whatever would just done, yeah. abort on a, Chimod doesn't abort on it. Like if you're recursively Chimoding a directory, it just says, "Hey, this one doesn't exist," and it keeps going. So it's going to do that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's basically it's just running the command at the command line in the background. So whatever the behavior at the command line would be will be reflected in this. So we have a question in the chat window. Um, yeah. Is the request for an undo last transaction uh, button? Is that something that would be feasible? Mm. Huh. Uh, certainly could be. Yeah, that that is that is doable. Um, we'd have to consider it. Um, yeah, yeah, we could do that. I have a question. This is Ravi. So, uh, 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 if you go up to the window where you are browsing the file system, mm -hmm. and after the change has been completed, would you be able to see that in yeah. here? Yeah. Okay. It'll show up here. Uh, unfortunately, I did changes that are <laughs> that are in line with what was there already, so you can't really verify. But yeah, so, so something maybe a little simpler than trying to undo it. Is it possible to pause or, or to, to to cancel something that hasn't been? Um, oh, if it hasn't it, run yet. Yeah. So if so if you if something is in the queue and they're mm -hmm. like, oh shoot, I pushed the wrong button. And yeah, yeah. Pushed. So that so just just say like yeah. So like down button, here, it being able yeah, to yeah, just, just be canceling mm -hmm. a pending request. Us, that might be a little easier to implement. Yeah, that might be a good idea. So in your, in your presentation, you start with HPSS. Will you be able to select HPSS directory as well here? It's currently just aimed at CFS, um, yeah. this particular tool. We'll talk about some other tools for HPSS later. Mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing to say that we couldn't eventually add HPSS as a, as a feature on here, but that would be farther down the line. Okay. All right, I just want to um, point out we're aiming to um, launch this tool um, in the beginning of June. Uh, so we have the security um, review coming up soon and we're planning to 
be able to deploy these uh, tools uh, for users within a couple of weeks. So we'll be updating, uh, we can update you all about that um, in the NERSC uh, weekly users newsletter. Uh, I just had a couple of feature requests. I, <clears throat> it sounded like uh, shown was not either not possible or was pending. Um, it's in development, the, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the being able to change ownership to the collaboration account is pretty critical for what I do. Um, also curious about uh, access control lists. You know, set fackle, get fackle. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, yeah, we're currently not supporting those, but we might be able to in the future. Yeah, one of the things, I mean, we were thinking about in the future is maybe some ability to, to do some, some more of those things. Um, mm -hmm. All right, that, that's fine because, like, well, once things are owned by the collaboration account, then you can just go in true yeah and but uh but yeah that's so you know getting shown kind of, working would be a good workaround for that yeah and it would be nice not to make you kind of go into two different interfaces to make the changes that you want okay if there are were there any other questions about the pi dashboard like not so um but feel free to to hit us up in the chat or or contact us directly so we'll move on to our next uh capability and this is um this is uh and uh, something that we've just recently deployed at NERSC that um, is aimed at allowing uh collaboration accounts to use globus to make transfers um so just in case you don't use collaboration accounts um what collaboration are uh, collaboration accounts are a nurse construct and what they are is they're a mapping of many users in one group to one user. Uh, it's frequently used for managing data as it comes in, installing software, um, and sometimes running jobs as a group. Um, and what it does is it lets you share the burden of data management software installation um, between multiple people. Um, and also keeps it for being, if someone leaves your collaboration, you don't have to go and show in a bunch of stuff. It's sort of a shared, a shared uh, tool that's useful for for data management and, and installations. Um, but up until this point, Globus transfers into NERSC with collaboration accounts were really awkward um, because it's a NERSC construct that you couldn't come in as this, as this account. Um, so you would transfer in as yourself. Um, then you'd file a ticket and ask to have all the data that you just moved in shown to the collaboration account. You'd have to wait you know, however long that took for the ticket to get processed and it's shown to run. Um, so we just started a new program at NERSC um, that uses Globus sharing. Uh, that creates a dedicated endpoint that will write as the collaboration account. So it creates one endpoint for each collaboration account that's interested in this. Uh, and then when you access it as yourself, you're writing to the NERSC system as the collaboration account. Um, and the, the access to this endpoint is controlled such that only NERSC users who have a, a Globus account and can already access the collaboration account can see this endpoint. Um, and once it's once you can see the endpoint, you have read write access to all the files and directories that NERSC that the collaboration account had access has us access to. So this includes Globus, Globus sharing, CFS. Um, this is not yet hooked up to HPSS. Again, that's something that might come in the future, but not right now. We don't have Globus sharing enabled on HPSS, but this would be at least share, uh, scratch in CFS. So let me just give you a quick demo of this. So um, hopefully. You guys are seeing the Globus screen right now. Um, and this is fairly familiar. So this is just www.globus.org. I already logged in, so you guys don't need to um, enjoy watching me do my password. But you can look, this is, I'm logged in as my account. Um, so if we go over here, we go to the NERSC DTN. Um, and then we can go to this uh, test uh, endpoint I've created here. This is data dash. There's a, this is a staff uh, collaboration account that we use here at NERSC. Um, this is a specific, this is a shared endpoint that lives on one of our DTN, that, uh, that it's a shared endpoint that's served out of one of our DTN nodes. Um, here I am looking at Global Homes DD Data Dash, the home directory of Data Dash, it's pretty much empty. Um, so I can come back to my home directory. Um, I can just transfer one of these text files over 
um, should go fairly quickly. Um, so we just can hit refresh. Um, it should see it's already there. And then if we pop over um, to the uh, shell window, here I am, I'm logged in as data dash. And you can see there's this file 0201 that has been written to the account as the data dash account. Um, so we have a pilot program with a couple of groups um, creating these endpoints for these collaboration accounts. Um, and it, uh, <clears throat> if you, this is something that you're interested in, please let us know. Um, trying to bring up the Zoom window and it's not being successful. Um, okay, so so that's uh, so that's how you can do Globus transfers with collaboration accounts. Um, does anybody have any questions before I move on to the next one? I have a short question. So can this be also done for the project name? Like I have project M245453. Uh, it, needs, it needs to have a user account to map to. So for that, if you wanted to do that, you would have to create a, a collaboration account that it would write as. OK, so if user Balevsky is a member of this project, I will still own the files. It's if, if I would use this interface now. Uh, so you wouldn't, so this is an interface. So if you, okay, so that we have to create an endpoint um, specifically to do this. So right now you can, as yourself, transfer files um, with Globus into the into this project directory and it would write as you. Um, if you wanted to write as a collaboration account, then you would need to open it. You need to have a collaboration account in mind and then you would need to open a ticket and we can work with you to, to set up this endpoint. Thanks. Yeah. And I see there's a question in Zoom. Um, yeah. So you should just open a ticket if you're interested in this um, or email me directly. Um, okay. Uh, hi, Lisa. Hi. Uh, are you planning to connect it to the, potentially connect it to the interface that Annette just showed? So eventually you have an ability to change owners to other people that are part of your collaboration that might that you may not want to have Globus transfer privileges on? Um, yeah, so I, I think that you could do that now with the, with the Nets PI interface, as long as that user is, you know, that data is already in a group that you are a PI over, um, you should be able to chone it to anyone that's in your, um, when we have chone, and it will, you should be able to chone it to anyone that's in your project. Okay, as um, long as the PI proxy is allowed, they can. Uh, yeah use the other interface great yes yeah they're, they're not going to cancel each other out so i think there's still going to be needs you know the the, the Glo globus transfers with the collaboration accounts were a lot there were a lot of chones from there but i think there's still going to be a lot of um uh, other chones that need to happen that will use this pi dashboard like when someone leaves or someone's trying to share data that kind of stuff uh, and that's still going to be possible Okay, oops. Hello, I just had, this is Stuart Campbell from the Brookhaven. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask as well for, is there any plans in the future to sort of connect in via a collaboration account? Because of course, if we're a, a facility that's creating data that we want to send, we don't want to run systems at our end as a particular person. We want them to run as, you know, a particular light source account or a mm -hmm. service account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, we, we, we do have that concept of people needing to connect in and be, um, be collaboration accounts. And um, via non-Globus, we do have ways to support that right now using um, our SSH proxy and long live uh, SSH keys. Um, and so if I think if that's something that you're interested in, I, I think you should open a ticket and we'll help you get okay. that set up. Stuart, are, are you asking about uh, federating accounts on both sides? Uh, no, it's more that, you know, we, so, at the NSLS2, uh, we have a, um, we, we don't want to run sort of the data management processes and sort of services as my personal account. We have them as a service account. And we want that to be able to transfer data to NERSC or to do things at NERSC. Um, and so it's, it's that sort of mapping that we don't have to run as a particular person at our end, be able to do things at your end. 
yeah, so so I think I think that should be that is possible, and we do have other workflows that are doing this now. So cool. thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So next we've got uh, next up in the. Okay. Um, next, I'm going to show um, some Globus command line tools that we've installed at NERSC. Um, so what these are is a, it's a set of scripts, command line tools, basically that are based on the Globus um, software development kit. Um, that you can use to manage transfers uh, both inside and outside of NERSC. Um, and the, the major perk of this, um, if you use this for NERSC transfers, is it understands HPSS tape ordering. Um, so right now, if you go and try and do Globus transfers out of our HPSS endpoint, maybe you, and you want to move a bunch of data out, um, Globus will not do this in an ordered manner, and, and it'll uh, perturb the system. You'll probably get a ticket from us asking, us, asking you to do something else. Um, but if you use these command line tools, it'll actually take your list of HPSS files you're trying to read and feed them to Globus in sorted order um, so that they'll be retrieved in the correct order from HPSS. Um, and then there's also some scripts that you can use to check on the transfer. Um, so you could use this to facilitate data, data staging for batch jobs. If you, if you were interested in that, you could you know, fire up a command line data, data transfer, it gives you a transfer ID, and then you can use the script to check uh, on the command line on and the status of the transfer. So you know when it's done, you can submit your job. Um, and these are these tools are going to serve as the building block um, for incorporating into Slurm um, for automatic data staging, um, probably for our next system. Um, and I'll do you, I'll show you a quick demo, um, but these are also outlined on our, our um, website uh, on the Globus page. There's a section on command line tools that you can um, you can look at for more details there. Um, so to get to these, um, so here, this is just me um, on Cori. You do uh, module load Globus tools to get to the command line tools. Um, and then this will put something called a Python script called transfer files into your path. Um, you can say transfer files minus H to find out how to use it. And basically what you do is you tell it where you're coming from, the source, the target, uh, where, where you're going to the target, um, and then what directory you want these files to land in at the target, and then uh, you give it a text list of the files you want to transfer. Um, and there's some optional arguments if, for instance, you want Globus to preserve timestamps on the other end, you can add this flag. Um, and so these source, the source and the target um, are source endpoint UUIDs, um, which are you can get from you can get from Globus if you just go to this endpoints page. Um, and just click on one of these guys. And then down here, this big, long, nasty number is the UUID. Um, but if you're inside of NERSC, um, you don't need to know that it, it understands the shortcuts DTN and HPSS. Um, it'll, it knows those UUIDs, so you don't have to look those up. Um, so that's some files here um, that are in HPSS. So I want to get them out and put them in my scratch directory. So I would just say transfer files minus s hpss the shortcut for that and then the target is going to be the dtn node uh, dtn endpoint because that has query scratch on it um, and then my scratch directory whoops <laughs> now it's hung up thinking about my wonderful um, i don't know about you guys but i compulsively hit tab and sometimes that doesn't help me very much for these things Lisa, does this yeah. have an rsync mode or where you it only transfers the things that um that 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 either you know that, that um aren't... it doesn't right now, but we could add it. There is an, an option in, in Globus where you can have this going on. Um, wow. So yeah, there's a flag in the Globus API that lets you compare files, right? Or yeah, yeah. So, so it's not in there. Okay, that that I don't know why that's toast, but let me just get a new one. Okay. So, minus s. Oops. So we can just fire up this transfer. Let's see, HPSS minus T, DTN. 
uh, minus D. Okay, I'm just going to put this in my home directory because <laughs> um, I don't know what, I'm not sure what's going on with the uh, Um, and then minus i is transfer list, and it'll go and submit this transfer and go off and talk to the Globus uh, API, and then it'll give you back a transfer ID. Um, and you can either go to the Globus page if you're more familiar with that, or you can use the script. You can just say, what's the story with this transfer? Um, and you can just give it your, your transfer. So right now it's thinking about it, and it's doing this transfer. Um, and you can do it without the parsable to see if there's some kind of, so, and then there's a minus P flag you can do on this transfer. So if you're doing this programmatically, you'll get some nice output where it's just this transfer ID and succeeded. Um, and we have, I have this, um, this little script that sort of shows how you could do it. It takes the same inputs, it submits this guy. Um, and then uh, you can, you could do the same thing, let's say for the batch system. Um, with the same arguments. Um, and you can give it the flag for um, some job you want it to run afterwards. And so what this will do is it'll submit the job to the X for Q um, and it'll run on the login node and it'll go off and do basically this transfer. Um, and it'll sit there and wait and watch um, while it uh, watch the job until this is done until this has succeeded um, and then it'll um, submit this other job this job analysis script that i gave it um, when this is done um, and so this uh all of this stuff is uh this dispatch this is documented on the globus web page and it's just an example so okay so it's succeeded now it's submitted this analysis script job um, so you can see it in the queue um, it's running right now doing the, doing the analysis. Um, so that's a way that you can incorporate um, data transfers into, into your batch scripts programmatically or into some kind of calls and use these helper scripts to do it. Um, and these, these endpoints, they don't have to be NERSC endpoints. Um, they could be any Globus endpoint. Let's go back to my slides. Just checking the chat for questions. I think. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. Okay. When when you're running those tools, how do you initially authenticate with Globus? You know, on its interface. Uh, okay. So um, the first time that you run this, um, it's going to look. In, so Globus does its um, transfers. Basically, gives you a token. And you can have a you can have a long lived token that auto activates, um, and so by default, it put this token into your home directory when you run it under a special directory in there. Um, and the first time that you run it, it's going to pop up a web page that will take you that you have to paste into your browser that will take you to Globus, where you go and you log in, you authenticate, and you say yes, I want to generate a token to do this, and then it'll give you this big long string, and you paste it back in, and then that'll make a token. And then after that, it'll just check, do you have a token? Does it work? And if it does, then it'll just go ahead and do the transfers. And if not, then it'll make you activate again. Yeah, um, sounds good, thanks. Yeah, and I think it's on Globus's roadmap to maybe like make this um, activation part a little bit less unpleasant, but I'm not sure how far in the future um, because having to pop out and go to a, a web page basically breaks command line tools, right? So it's not that great. Um, Okay, so if there's no other questions, then we'll go on to the the final thing that I was going to show today. Um, and this is, whoops, excuse me. This is uh, GI. What this is is a new prototype HPSS interface. Um, and GI stands for GPFS HPSS interface. Um, and it's a way to use the HPSS tape archive um, using a familiar file system interface. Um, so what happens is we have a prototype deployed at NERSC. And so if you go to our DTN nodes and you go to global project and projectors, you're on a GPFS file system that is linked with an HPSS tape archive and you can use GI there. 
Um, so what you do is you interact with that file system with that global project in project there's directory path um, and behind the scenes is tied to HPSS. Uh, and this lets you move data between GPFS and HPSS with, with just a few commands. Um, and behind the scenes, GI will put the files optimally, optimally into HPSS on your behalf. Um, so you don't need to worry about, you know, H turning small files together, breaking things into the optimal 500 gigabyte size chunks, um, you know, any kind of ordered retrievals. If you use the GI commands, it will interface with the HPSS system in the way that the HPSS system does best. Um, so, uh, you know, this, the, the nice thing about this shared file, the fact that you interact with this via file system is it's very familiar, um, but it's also a shared namespace. So if you delete something from this directory, it also gets deleted from the tape archive. Um, so it's, it really helps to think of it as a totally separate thing. This is an interface for the tape archive. Um, that's, that's how you would work with it. Um, it's also separate from the way that you talk to HPSS with HSI and HTAR. You would use GI to interface, interact with these. You would not use HSI and HTAR to work with these files. Um, and there's some documentation. This is census of the prototype system. Um, you know, uh, it, we're very happy to have you kick the tires on it, but obviously don't put any unique data in there. And it's in our dev um, document system here, down here to show you how to use it. Um, and some use cases that you might do for this, let's say you have um, thousands of files ranging in size from a few bytes to hundreds of gigabytes. Um, you know, in, in aggregate, this whole directory is 100 terabytes uh, and you wanna put this in HPSS. Um, and there are, the files are organized in a, a complex directory structure that you need to maintain so that you'll be able to track the materials in the files. You, know, you can't archive them anywhere, they need to be in this path. Um, so typically you would use, maybe you'd go down and HTAR each one of these subdirectories or break them up into pieces and it would be kind of a little bit of a chore to get them into HPSS. Um, with GI, you can use a single command to GI put and just give it the recursive flag and it'll put the entire directory into HPSS to take care of the bundling and whatnot behind the scenes. Um, another use case is where you have uh, like large volumes of infrequently accessed data. So you have hundreds of terabytes of data Maybe you only look at it a few times a year when you're doing reanalysis. Most of the time you're working with some derived product that comes from that. Um, you could use GI put to put the data into HPSS. Uh, maybe between the analyses, you can free up your disk space um, by using a, a GI punch command to move most of the data off of the GPFS file system. Um, but it would still leave a browsable directory structure behind. Um, and then if you need to get these directories back, you can just use GI stage to get all of them or some of them back. Um, so let me do a quick demo for this. Um, so like I said, this is on our DTN nodes. Um, so I set up this little demo directory. Um, I just got a bunch of, you know, kind of fake files in here. Um, you know, if we get to the subdirectory 2020, it's got subdirectory of more files in there. And there's another one, there's some smaller files in here. Um, you know, so it's a little bit of a, like if you were going to put this in, imagine there were many more files and they were much bigger, it'd be kind of painful to put this into HPSS. Um, so, what we can do is when we're on this special system, on this special file system, we can do a command called gls, and it'll tell you um, where the files are in which file system. So right now they have a G next to them, which means that they are only on the GPFS half of this file system. Um, and you can just kind of noodle around and look at these other ones, you know, and they're all, so they're all there, they're all just sitting on the GPFS file system. So let's put them into, um, into into the tape archive. So right now they're just in GPFS. So I'm going to say gi put, so put, that means put it into HPSS. I'm going to tell it minus r, which means do it recursively, and dot means do it for the whole directory. Um, and so it takes just a little bit of time to run this because it has to go down and check that each file is on the right file system uh, and that it has the right permissions. Um, but then when this is done, uh, you'll see that they're all um, going to be moved into the tape system. So we just did this, so we can say GLS, and now this letter has changed from G to B. Um, and what that means is it's no longer just on the GPFS system, it's now on both GPFS and HPSS. Um, and so if you can do this for all the directories, so they're all in HPSS now. Um, so if you wanted to move one of these files, since they're dual resident, they're in GPFS and HPSS both, let's say you wanted to move one of these off, and put it onto um, 
just have it be on HPSS and not be on GPFS. And one of the reasons you might do this is because you want to free up um, spinning disk space for something that's being um, being actively used. You know, maybe you're done with, let's say we're done with January. You know, it's already it's already May, so let's get rid of January. So we can say heat punch, and it'll go through and put these files in. Um, and we can do a GLS, and now you see that all these files um, have an H next to them, which means that they're only in the tape archive system. They're no longer on the GPFS system, except for a tiny stub that's used just for um, finding the file in HPSS and um, conveying the metadata about the file. Um, the other thing you can do with GIE is, uh, let's say you have a really important file that lots of people are, are looking at. Um, so let's let's do a GLS. Um, let's say there's something really exciting in um, data three, and you want to make sure that that doesn't get moved off off of the spinning disk because it'll immediately get pulled back by whatever. So you can do something called a pin. Um, you can key pin data three, um, and what that means now, if you look, you can see here it's got a, a P next to it. Um, and so what that means is if you went through and tried to punch these files, um, then let's, let's list them again. Um, you'll see that every single one of these files got moved off except for this pinned file, it stayed. So if you have data that's really important to you and you wanna make sure it's not um, moved off either by, um, by a, a user or by an automated system sweep, um, you can pin it. Um, so that's sort of, that's the entire nuts and bolts of how, of how you move these files. Oh, if you want to bring um, something back, you say stage, you want to bring it back from HPSS, uh, change our mind, we want data one back, um, you can just say key stage and it'll come back and be dual resident. Um, there's a little bit of extra talking that it does, but you can just ignore that. Um, so now data one is in both file systems. Um, and so I mentioned earlier that you can't really use this for with HSI or HTAR. And so let me show you um, show you why. Um, what it does is it it takes because it takes care of all the bundling and, and everything behind the scenes. Um, it ends up writing into HPSS in um, kind of this really yucky looking um, name for it. Um, and so you know you, it the connection to this file is is contained in the information on the GPFS file system. It tells it where to look for it in HPSS. Um, and so in order to get to the data that's in HPSS that's linked to this file, you need to go through the GI system. You can't use HSI or HTAR. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, oh, and I mentioned earlier before that um, it'll aggregate files for you. So let's see. Um, so let's let's look at these. These guys were small files. They were like 6K. And if you look at this file name, it's got this ag in front of it. And if you have really sharp eyes, I don't know how well this shows up, you'll see this actually the same name for all of these where this is in, in HPSS. So what it means is it took these small files and it bundled them together into one aggregate. Um, and so, um, so then it automatically took care of the fact that these are smaller files that need to be bundled together for you when it put it into HPSS. Uh, is just, that using HTAR under the covers? Or is that something else? It uses um, it uses HTAR um, under the covers, um, but it takes care of you, the sys system admins can control at what point things get bundled together. Like we can control the size of the bundles and the threshold, um, so it's not something that you as the user have to worry about. Um, so one last thing to to do, I mentioned you can, um, why you would want to, like you can punch files to make room. Um, so this is the quota of this file set on here. Um, it's a little bit nicer looking. Um, so it's, you know, it's about 12 terabytes. Um, and so if you go back here, so we have some big files here. And if I key punch a really big file, that's, I'm not gonna punch the three terabyte one because that seems excessive, but I'll punch the 300 gigabyte one. So if we punch this and it thinks about it for a minute and then we go back and we run our quota check. Um, oh, it was already punched, sorry. Let's see. I think I punched it earlier and forgot to uh, stage it. All right, fine. Apologies to the um, punch. So we'll punch, we can punch this big guy and it may take a few minutes to think about it. 
um, and then you can see that the quote has changed. Um, but it takes a little, unfortunately, it takes a little longer to delete three terabytes than it does um, 300 gigabytes. So if there's a, Lisa, there's a question in chat um, whether oh. he has uh, the limitations that HTAR has, uh, like limits on the member file sizes. So that, um, no, it'll, it'll take care of, so GI bundles what we tell it to bundle. Um, so if it's bigger than, we wouldn't set a threshold. So we wouldn't normally be bundling, our threshold would be below 68 gigabytes. So you wouldn't feel those effects. Um, so we would set up the smaller files to bundle um, and it would automatically aggregate those things for you. Um, and you wouldn't run into that issue, nor would you run into the issue of um, a really long path name in HTAR, um, because again, it does the bundling for you underneath the covers. And it actually does um, ishtar, which is like related to um, HTAR. So, okay, so we punched the three terabyte one. It took a little longer than I wanted for a demo, but you can see that now the usage on the GPFS file system has gone down by quite a bit. So you freed up space. Uh, Create up space for other things that you may need to access more, more quickly. Okay, so um, I, we were supposed to have the Globus sharing one, but I think there's probably not enough time. Um, no, so I think we'll we'll arrange to have the um, Bjorn's Globus sharing demo in one of the uh, future upcoming demo sessions. Yeah, apologies to you, Bjorn. Sorry. Um, but anyway, if anyone's interested in trying out these services, uh, just please feel free to reach out to us either directly or open a ticket. Um, and especially you gave us some really good feedback already, but if there's anything else missing that you'd really like to see, um, definitely let us know. You said you have a link to some of the documentation for this stuff. So for people to start playing around with it. Um, I do, they're in this, they're on the slide pages. Um, so I'm not sure how, that you're gonna disseminate the slides, right Debbie? Uh, yes, yes we can okay. do. Them from there, yeah. We'll um, add the slides to the web page, uh, which I'm just putting in the um, Zoom link, but is also in the calendar invite. I had a uh, a comment, sort of back on the the PI dashboard kind of pieces. Was there any thought about um, like within a a file system area like a, a community directory to have like a top level directive that you could just someone the pi could say like this is how i want the permissions to be like make sure all these directories are owned by this account or something like that yeah so i mean right now the the one button that does a whole bunch of stuff at once it will set everything to be uh owned by the 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 group that owns the top level directory itself. Um, so are you thinking having it an option where you could change that and have something different? Or? I'm thinking it might be useful if it was just something that would, you just would specify it in the directory as a file and it would get periodically kind of audited and fixed. So the user oh, would have to actively go in and, and do something. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. That's something that we've actually done for a bit. Um, is that, Lisa, what's the status of that? Right now, there was a for a while at least the the ability to request that, and then we would have a script that would just run in the background and do it. Yeah, so that that runs now for four or five groups that um, uh, have sort of had it, had this come up over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, that is something that that definitely we want to think about for the future is some way for them to let us know that like I want this to be happening all you know to do this and keep it in place. You know, I think that's. Yeah. You just have to think about how we would do it in a in a easy easy to use way. Okay, cool. Quick question. I'm sure it's probably in the documentation. Is there a way to check the age of the HPSS files? Like when it was punched? Um that's a good question. I don't think that there is, um, but if you if you change the file on the GPF, the link GPFS system, that will that is that is linked to the HPSS file, so it would 
pick that up if that's what you're asking. Well, I was thinking since there's a quota in place, you might want a management system that decides when you had to decide to keep quota and you had to pull a really big file, you have to push something back. You may want to pick the oldest thing and then push that back. And mm -hmm. so that way you have the only the freshest last sets of files available on disk at any given time. Mm -hmm. And the last thing that you ever want to touch gets to go back. Right, this is the old thing or something. Okay, that's, yeah. 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 I'm writing that down. Yeah, I mean, something like that should be doable. I mean, one, one of the things certainly we're thinking about is to have, um, to have things that, policies that could be done at the file set level, right? At the, at the top level of that directory, you know, the, the project directory. Um, and so something like that could be implemented there. Also, do you see these services connected to things like the Globus solution uh, as well, like a Globus sharing straight into uh, this GI folder? Yeah, so I, I think that if we were to do the Globus interface um, with HPSS, this seems like the, the, the way that the GI interface is the way that Globus is most used to dealing with, with HPSS. And so I think that with some modifications, for instance, if you were doing a read via Globus to a GI thing, you'd want to do a stage first to bring the files up. Um, you'd want to incorporate that into the Globus itself. But um, it's it's the most that's the way that Globus is built. Globus is built to talk to a file system, and it's it's very awkward to make it to talk to HPSS. And so, you know, if we did have this, then I think that that would become a very common way that users would use the system is via G Globus to GI. All right, we're at the top of the hour now, so I think uh, we have to wrap up. Uh, thanks everyone for attending. Um, the recording of this will be posted on the website later today, and I hope you can all join us uh, next week uh, for our next demo, which will be on the NERSC Super Facility API. Right, thanks everyone. Bye bye. Thanks, Debbie. Bye.